Welcome back, everyone, to the Investors Roundtable. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. You can follow me on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft, B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. It's the first one we've done since November. Uh, back, back uh, I think that was $50 of, uh, uh, ago in a barrel of oil. Um, and uh, I'm just, I'm very excited to have everybody back here today. Uh, it's been a while. I love doing these and uh, we'll try and do them a little bit more frequently here in 2022. But uh, with that, joining me today, uh, I, I, listen, no, no introduction necessary to the gentleman, at least how I'm looking at it to my left. But uh, uh, we got Josh Young from Bison Interest. As you can imagine, we're going to be talking a lot about energy today and oil and gas. Uh, and then also joining me to ask questions uh, is, <laughs> is uh, Stephen Keel from Marquitos Capital, as Thank well you. as Kevin Shea at The Good Prick on Twitter. What's up, guys? How are you doing? Good to be here. Well, right. yeah, it's, been a, it's been a while. It's nice to get back on with this. I've, I've missed these for sure, and I think we'll have a fun time today. Yeah, oh yeah. I, I don't know if we'll go back to doing it weekly, but maybe at a minimum, like every other week or once a month, something like that. I, I it's just so much. It's it's a lot of fun. But let's get to the task at hand. You know, actually, Josh was you were on you and Kevin were on the last one that we did. We published that I think November some sometime in November last year. I joked that it was fifty dollars a barrel, or I guess the difference wasn't fifty dollars a barrel. So. Why, why don't we give everyone kind of a an update what's going on and and what's what's really happening in energy markets? Okay, so what we found um, kind of really simply, and I think I rambled a lot about this the last time I was on, and it felt maybe a little less relevant at the time, but it was happening and you could see it. Was energy um, the attention had been shifted away during a seven year bear market for oil, and we were running out. And you could see we were running out of rigs and frack stacks and offshore uh, rigs and labor, and we were running out of oil inventories. And so we were hitting this wall and it was crazy being in the middle of it and no one caring. And the, the biggest thing that happened that I thought was crazy and really just, I guess, like put me over the edge a little bit in terms of just like it being surreal was there was this energy crisis in Europe in September and October, where the local gas price, natural gas for heat and power, rose 5x over a less than one year period and hit record levels. And almost no one paid attention to it except people, certain people in Europe. And so that was kind of the starting point. And so oil has risen a lot because uh, inventories have depleted a lot. And then, of course, there, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, and there's been a lot of uncertainty around the oil supply from Russia, and that's kind of taken oil up this next notch. But what really did it was this shortage that was building for all these years, and then a catalyst being Russian oil production coming offline. So that's like, I think that background is really important because it really frames what's happening, and I think it frames what's likely to happen next. Josh, is the is the shortage global, or can it be designated uh, by by consuming countries, consuming areas? Uh, the shortage for oil is global, yep. and the shortage for natural gas is not in the U.S. or Canada, but basically almost the rest of the world is short natural gas. And can you can you? I understand you said that you saw everything running out. Can, can you describe what you've been watching for the last three to five years? I'm, I'm looking for foundational types of understanding is, you know, you went through the litany, you know, the not, no more rigs, no more people, no more, you know, everything was running out. Um, but that, that obviously develops over time. And, and what, I'm, what I'm trying to understand is how did that occur? I mean, ultimately, if you go back to the previous administration, you know, we were so-called energy independent. Um, you know, so it was there. Was there a foundational issue that was going on that was inevitable, or would it have been uh, avoidable if the same processes were in place rather than shutting down Keystone, et cetera? I mean, I'm asking a lot here, but I'm just trying to get a sense for, um, you know, previously, you know, you know, right now we're dealing with the Ukrainian thing and European demands and all this stuff. But how does it how does it fit in the U.S.? I mean, how does the U.S. be independent, energy independent at one time? And then literally less than two years later, not. So, I mean, that's a lot to say, but sorry. So um, these things always seem obvious in retrospect, 
Um, and at the time, it's often really hard to understand what's happening. And so commodity cycles work in a way where at the bottom, everyone was convinced that it's going away. And you can use economist covers or other sorts of things as indicators of that um, in terms of really extreme negative sentiment. And then miraculously, the real world and physics take hold and you need these commodities as inputs for human activity. And so, I mean, there have been multiple commodity super cycles that have started like this, where there were years or decades of underinvestment and for oil, the thing that you could track that told you there was going to be a positive super cycle, and I think JP Morgan and a couple others have done a really good job with this over years, getting derided for it. I think Jeff Curry at, at Goldman has done a good job with this too. You could track oil exploration. And going back to about 2012, that was roughly the peak of oil exploration activity. And so what's been happening is the big discoveries were made um, through, let's say, 2014, 2016, from the investments made leading up to, let's say, 2012 or even 2008. As we've stopped exploring, then you run out of discoveries to develop. And so you kind of, you burn through, if you think about it, like any sort of like sales pipeline or any sort of uh, manufacturing process, if you get rid of the starting point and you work it through, at some point you have to start again, and where it becomes a crisis is if you've just underinvested across the whole chain, starting over means that you have to take 10 years or eight years in order to kind of refill. And I think that's where this seven year downturn in oil prices really led to a lot of, and, and natural gas prices in Europe and coal and other commodities, it led to this problem where it's not just an easy fix, there's this whole set of problems. So the energy independence, I think, was to some extent a facade, but um, it definitely doesn't help that pipeline projects, in some cases, they were almost completely built and had been very well studied and were approved from all different perspectives, were canceled. And it definitely doesn't help that leases that were necessary in order to engage in certain drilling and completion activity were no longer available that were considered to be readily available previously. So these things from a policy perspective have really hurt the short term ability to deliver, but there was this much longer term problem that had me bullish well before this specific geopolitical event. You know, from, I mean, we talk about the, you're talking about the, the supply side, um, demand side obviously is different given the pandemic for the last few years what kind of, uh, I guess, effect or what kind of observations or comments do you think you can, uh, you know, can attribute to, to this? Yeah, I mean, I think that there have been these fables that have been told. And in bull markets, you hear lots of positive things about whatever's working, whatever the, uh, that sector that's particularly outperforming. And you, you go from kernels of truth to giant exaggerations and essentially fallacies. And so, um, for example, with alternative energy, there's been this bubble for a number of years that was unsubstantiated economically and unsubstantiated from an engineering perspective. The levelized cost of delivery of energy is much higher than the claimed cost of delivery. And there were many headlines and stories and companies and investors that all sounded great, but the engineering wasn't there. And it was observable that it wasn't there. The, the, the base point was a lie. And it was just wrong, but there was this whole thing built on it. Electric vehicles is similar. Electric vehicles consume through their life from the manufacturing and the starting point of of uh, mining the metals necessary for the batteries, they consume almost as much oil over their whole life as a gas powered, a gasoline powered car with the added environmental detriment of having to mine all those uh, rare earth metals and other stuff. So there was this lie of return on energy investment. And there was a lie about the environmental friendliness that built up with very charismatic people who were lauded. In some cases, they still have hundreds of billions of dollars of valuation for their companies. In other cases, like Rivian, it just, I think, read it's down 80% from its IPO or something. So some of these are collapsing. Some of them 
are about to collapse or maybe about to collapse. But there was this whole long, big narrative that was built that was counterfactual relative to engineering and physics. And so I think that's like, that's where you end up with these big stories and big bubbles and companies and sectors and allocations that are built just incorrectly. And this is through the history of capitalism. We see this, it's creative destruction. It, it helps eventually spur developments and innovations that lead to things working, but you also you have many Theranoses along the way, unfortunately, with the way that we have things set up. So how does, how does uh, I know we talked about it as being a global issue, of course, and you know, you're getting prices for the WTC, WTIC and you get different prices in Europe and all that stuff. How, how, how can you, I mean, you've under, underscored the whole thing about peak exploration and uh, running out. And I mean, and of course now we're seeing it in the pricing of, of energy, energy in Europe, particularly in Germany. And, and again, I mean, we talk about Germany being, you know, they shut down all the nuclear plants. Um, I mean, is it, did, are they digging themselves a huge hole or have they done that already? Or what's going on in Germany that uh, prices have risen so dramatically? Uh, again, Stephen mentioned about demand and, and things of that type, but you know, how, how, do, how does that all factor in? So Germany is not a good place to build large scale solar power generation. I mean, really? it's, it's not like it doesn't require being a meteorologist or a physicist to understand that a place that is overcast much of the time is not a good place. Their, their irradiance on a square foot or mile or however you want to measure it in Germany is very low compared to, for example, Southern Nevada. So there it's are not, it's, places- It's actually the same as Maine, which is where yeah. I am right now. And okay. it's, it's been cloudy for the last four months. Right. So, so it doesn't take a lot of common sense to figure that out, but the people responsible for making these decisions have been committees and bureaucrats and companies that are heavily funded by governments or heavily funded by asset allocators who also are run by committees and also raise their money from committees and bureaucrats. And there's this, just this like staggering, if you remember what happened in Greece where the Greek economy collapsed in 2010 and 2011, and everyone was so surprised and they all pointed fingers at how terrible the Greek economy was because of all these specific bureaucratic issues and the, the ways different decisions were made at businesses. The reality was that Greece was a microcosm for the Western uh, political and economic set up. And so when you have these just committees on committees where it's all about what's the most politically correct thing, how can we distinguish ourselves by virtue signaling the most individually and as a group, you end up with these things that are just nonsense. So if you build a big amount of your power gen to be solar and wind, and you don't build enough batteries because you can't, because when it's cloudy for four months and you built enough batteries for two minutes, after two minutes, you're done. And, you know, and, and also you can't ever build four months worth of batteries because you will consume all of the world's resources in order to build four months of batteries for Western Europe. So, um, and it doesn't even work because then the batteries uncharge, you try charging, it's like your cell phone, right? You can only charge it a certain amount. And then even if you don't use it, the battery discharges over time. So you end up with this just increasing problem based on things that are observably not true, um, but it didn't seem to matter. The utopians uh, took the rein and everyone was listening to a teenager and a pre-teenager going and saying, <laughs> how dare you, when, when, and, and ignoring the engineering and physics. So I think this was inevitable and it's similar to what happened in the seventies and similar to what happened in prior commodity cycles. I mean, this isn't, this, it's not the same but it, it really rhymes with what happened then. And, and, I would, and I would jump in and say, it's, it's not that we don't disagree with the sentiments of you know wanting to to go to more cleaner energy i think we all agree we would love we want that we we want to get you know uh, we just we just want a healthier planet of course you know but at the same time if the science and the physics and everything hasn't caught up to it yet you can't just throw it all out and say uh you know ah, we'll just make it work it's you know and because that's part almost part of the reason why we are where we're at today because what do we do now i mean all right i mean 
we had this horrible, horrible war going on in Ukraine where Russia invaded Ukraine for no freaking reason. Sorry, it gets me pretty upset about it. But we have this war going on. We sanction Russia. We cut off the spigot. We're not importing any more Russian oil. Now we have our, I was reading, you know, I was reading different articles about the administration going and speaking with, you know, United Arab Emirates, Venezuela, Iran to go import oil that we desperately need. How, how, how are we supposed to think about this, you know, and, and what, where do we go from here? I mean, how, how do we up domestic production so that we don't have to deal with other authoritarian regimes? So, so I think the first thing is that we made a giant mistake, and I think it was driven by, um, I think it's just institutional corruption. It's way easier to skim money from companies and from manufacturing than it is to skim it from pure science. And so we made a huge mistake as a society when we listened to Al Gore in 2000 and we, in 2001, after he didn't become president and he became a climate evangelist, and we said, okay, the world is ending, and it didn't, and all those predictions were wrong, and they all have been pushed off by 10 or 20 years, and there's never accountability. But the, the huge mistake we made was to start funding manufacturing from the government instead of funding research from the government. The pure science was just not done. And we believed charlatans who said that it was done and they proceeded to miss every target from a science perspective. They ended up stacking laptop batteries, which makes no sense from an engineering perspective. It's just a bad idea. And building a million electric cars a year with stacked laptop batteries. They didn't solve the battery problem. They just used a different technology that was repurposed and is not environmentally friendly and is not, it just doesn't make sense from an ERI perspective. So, so I think like that there's a basic problem, which is that we didn't do a Manhattan project where we took all the smartest people and we funded them to the nth degree in order to do the research. Instead, we just took whatever was there. We pretended like it was economic. We pretended like it worked and we funded it. And we're seeing now it just doesn't work across a lot of different, um, measures. And I think we'll see more on the electric car front that this is also true. I mean, it's the same, the same starting point, the same sort of government subsidies and subsidies by growth investors who believe in unicorns and whatever. And so um, I think, uh, I think we're seeing that. So I think that's a starting point. I'm very in favor of that sort of funding. The problem is when you fund subsidizing manufacturing of technologies that are intrinsically non-functional, that are intrinsically low energy return on investment. That's like the thing that really bothers me. And I think it's really unfortunate because you hurt the world, right? Because you pollute a lot and you reduce the ability to actually do anything good. Because if you wanted to like, you think, oh, I'm doing a good thing by buying this electric car. Well, you might actually be polluting more by buying the, if you look at the total totality of the pollution around it versus just buying, keeping your used car that is fairly fuel efficient and doesn't require a whole new manufacturing process or you buy a really fuel efficient, just uh, gasoline power car. So that's uh, on, on that side, I completely agree. It's just really unfortunate. Um, I. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. May I jump in? Um, what, how do you view the oil and gas consumption, uh, transportation vis-a-vis -vis everything else? Because everything else is dependent upon uh, petroleum products uh, or some sort of, some sort, some sort of combustible. Uh, and again, I don't know what the numbers are. I know that transportation is very heavily weighted, but again, is the, is, how does, how does the, um, the, oil issues, the cost of that affect manufacturing or whatever, just, just the manufacturing of plastics, for example. Yeah. So, I mean, you can get plastics from natural gas liquids and from natural gas. You don't necessarily need oil. Um, you can't really get plastics from stuff like corn. The calculations around that are wrong because corn ends up requiring a lot of fertilizer as an input and fertilizer requires hydrocarbons. So there's this just like really basic failure of understanding of engineering and supply chains that goes into a lot of these policies. I mean, the, the idea that we subsidize ethanol, which has a low EROI, and we just end up doing a lot of damage to the planet. We pollute the water systems and we kill algae and we do all this stuff and we kill our soil in order to grow corn to burn it instead of gasoline. 
I mean, you just it's just a very bad vicious cycle. So um, in terms of transportation, I think the numbers, I think we use like 30 or 40 percent, something like that, of oil for uh, personal transportation. The, the problem with replacing it is the history of energy consumption. I think I've heard this from a few different uh, places. Um, the, the history of energy consumption, and, and it, it just makes logical sense, is that you always go from less dense sources of energy to more dense sources mm -hmm. of energy. So you go right. from pulling stuff yourself. Humans are very inefficient in terms of consuming calories and then generating strength and pulling uh, to horse-drawn stuff with where you put it on a horse to a horse with a wagon to burning steam and using steam propulsion and coal, uh, first wood, which is less dense, and then coal, which is more dense, and then oil and oil products, which are even more dense. Using batteries pushes you way back on the density side. And so it's just a hard thing. We're not there from a science perspective. You want it to be more dense, not less. When you solve for less dense, you cause huge problems in terms of the input. Like how do you, and how do you essentially energize this thing, which is way less dense? How do you make it make sense from a logistic perspective? Like how does the car that's using a 1 50th as dense source of propulsion, how does that, propel itself? How do you solve that physics problem? We just haven't solved it yet. And it looks like we've solved it, but we have these vehicles that are massively polluting, that catch fire on their own, that, I mean, there's just, a, they, I mean, and, and you can tell that it's a problem because they also do other things. Like it's a indicator from public companies. Uh, there's a cockroach theory from Warren Buffett. You never see just one, if you see one cockroach, there's often more. So one of the ways to tell is the leading electric car company also sells a product they've sold for years that's ostensibly, it's called full self-driving. But it, it when you turn it on, you end up crashing into fire trucks or semi trucks or whatever. It, it's not full self-driving. It was a beta or an alpha test for many years oh, and it's killed, it's killed a lot of people. And so that's an indicator, I think, that if you if you didn't believe anything I was saying about the engineering, maybe it makes sense to at least look at it because they have this other thing that they also claim similarly, or the solar tiles, which didn't exist and were essentially made up as a, a marketing scheme. You can look at these things that don't exist that are claimed by the same people and say, okay, hey, that's a problem. So that's a problem. So I know now to look at these other things. But purely from a transportation perspective, so when you look at world transportation and world demand for oil, there is a false narrative that was perpetuated during the pandemic that world oil demand had peaked. And if the governments around the world continued the bans on people going outside, that was true. But if these pandemic era bans were reversed and if the world would be able to continue in some form of normality, we were not anywhere close to peak demand for oil. And the incremental demand for oil is poorly understood. It's mostly third world, essentially frontier market, emerging market countries where there are very poor farmers and very poor other, uh, essentially in that category of people that farmers and craftsmen that are buying a gas powered scooter and using one gallon of gasoline a week to bring their product to market to get a better price for their product. And so the incremental economics on that use of the gallon of gasoline a week or gallon of diesel a week or whatever that number of uh, amount that they're using is, is enormous for those people. And when you see the world getting more wealthy and the poorest people getting a little, their, their life being a little less tough, that's where you see incremental use of gasoline. That's where almost all of the incremental oil consumption over the last number of years has come from. So it's a very good thing to see because it means that that desperately poor person in India or China or Sub-Saharan Africa or South America is now able to have a better life. And so I think when we have like the Greta Thunbergs or whatever the world, like they're coming from a place of economic privilege and trying to withhold or make much more expensive products that are on the margin, helping the poorest. And, and I'll try to get off a of soapbox in a second, but that's where the demand is coming from. So when you understand where the demand is coming from and who's using it, it becomes, I think, a much more complicated question in terms of 
both what's the peak demand going to be? Because like, how wealthy is that farmer going to be? Are they going to have a car? Or are they going to have a gas powered scooter? And that's really the question is peak demand going to be 115, 115 million barrels a day? Is it going to be 150? Is it going to be 105 because we don't have any more oil to produce? I don't know. I mean, the, these are open questions, but it's almost certainly not 100 million barrels a day because I think we're already in excess of the prior peak. But you were saying that the uh, peak demand may not be uh, supportable if the if the, we're running out, as you mentioned, at the very early part. So where's the where's the the break even? I, I don't know if it's break even point, but where's the crossover point where peak demand um, exceeds peak peak delivery or peak 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 production? So right now we're dealing with this, this issue across the value chain for oil, like I described earlier. And so with seven years of underinvestment, you now need reinvestment in oil services in order to be able to get more oil out of the ground at a less, uh, you know, at a, a less urgent way. You don't need to like rapidly manufacture on a one-off basis the screw that's necessary for your drilling rig. You have a whole set of screws because you've invested in your working capital in order to have enough. So there's a huge amount of reinvestment that's necessary. And the oil services companies are still not making money. They're not making enough to reinvest in order to rebuild their capacity to deliver such that upstream oil producers are able to use those newly manufactured additional services or additional working capital in order to bring oil out of the ground. So it's an open question right now in terms of what is the marginal cost for the marginal barrel of oil. It looks like the market is telling us, and it was telling us this even before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it's telling us that it's higher than the price has been. And so I don't know whether that's going to be on an inflation adjusted basis, the price that it was at from 2010 to 2014. So that was around $100 a barrel then, which would be about $130 a barrel now. There's been a lot of inflation recently. Um, or whether it's going to be a higher number, maybe it's 150, maybe it's 170. Every cycle, that number has reset up on an inflation adjusted basis. So we don't know. And anyone that tells you doesn't really know either. And it's, you can try to measure it, but it's extremely complicated. There's a lot of circularity in terms of those costs. And there's a lot of cyclicality in terms of the demand for those goods in order to then go drill and complete and bring on wells and explore for new fields. Um, and then there's a lot of circularity in terms of the uh, supply of those and the costs associated with them too. So okay. it's a very, very complicated question. And the people that claim to have the most precise answers have been the most wrong. The big energy consulting firms, many of the ostensible experts who have been on TV and have frankly embarrassed themselves for years with their just absolutely wrong calls and inaccurate predictions. And I think my take is um, actually my old intern who's now super famous, he likes to say, or he liked to say that he would rather be directionally correct than precisely wrong. And so I know I'm right. I just don't know exactly what that price is. So if we, if we talk maybe for a minute or two about specific investments, uh, how do you play this thesis? Um, specific companies, potential mispriced opportunities. So what's your opinion there? Yeah, so I think there's a consensus right now among oil and gas investors generally to invest in companies that are returning capital through debt pay down, dividends, and share buybacks. And I'm a value investor. So I like that, but I think that's wrong. And I think that those investors, it's always easy to kind of buy into whatever the kind of current flavor of the moment is. And it's very hard to look ahead. So where I think the best opportunities are now are companies, producers, upstream companies that have large amounts of inventory that the market is not appreciating. And in some cases, those are very expensive and I don't like to pay up for stuff, I'm a value guy, so that's not so interesting. On the smaller side of the producers, there are some producers that are sitting on decades of inventory with the ability at even you know 20% lower prices than the current price of oil, you know the, the pre essentially conflict price uh, for oil or higher, they have the ability to grow at a double digit rate for a decade or more while generating substantial free cash flow. So that's one set. 
And then another set of companies are the services companies that are best positioned with the tightest markets for their particular services that are likely to be the tightest over the next six months to a year where they're gonna have the most pricing power on those services. So those are kind of the two areas and neither of those services are starting to get more in favor, but people are not really differentiating. And on the upstream side, I think people are just completely missing this. And it's just been such this mantra and there are whole funds and famous people that are like orienting their careers essentially around this. And I think they're missing the boat. And I think it's gonna be really interesting. I think if you look back at past cycles, this is not that different. And there were very clear winners and there are very clear likely winners from my perspective here that, I don't know, I guess people just, I don't know, there are various reasons why history ends up rhyming. Is it mostly domestic or is it, or, or, or the various opportunities that you're speaking of um, outside US, Canada? Uh, I mean, there's great opportunities in the US and Canada. I have a little bit of exposure outside of the US and Canada. And right now, I think that's actually very risky. So the US and Canada, the geopolitical risk for producers was rising a lot until recently. And now that I think there's more of a recognition of a need for domestic production, and I guess I'd define that as North American production, um, I think there's much less risk of crazy bad policies. There were a number of very foolish policies that are now foolish in retrospect. I mean, the cancellation of a major pipeline that was almost done with construction that had been studied many times and was approved across the border and by essentially everyone, I think that was a very big mistake. And I think there were similar sort of mistakes like that. I think it's very unlikely that there are more mistakes like that, given how much attention there is right now on growing domestic production, even if, and hopefully this happens, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war is settled tomorrow. So um, I think there's a lot of geopolitical risk in many places around the world, and the US and Canada, I think are, and in Mexico are relatively safe and relatively stable um, compared to those places. And Josh, real, well, Kevin, real quick, I just, because I asked this one earlier, and I think it's one of the, the more basic, like, uh, questions that main street is probably asking themselves because i mean i'm i'm a basic uh, basic b if i may um <laughs> Steve, sorry i'm trying to bring some levity to uh to, uh, the tire situation we're dealing with in energy but i asked this earlier you know um we're seeing our governments going having those conversations venezuela iran united arab emirates for those who who are seeing this and now saying wait now we have to go and import more oil from other regimes? Like, how, how should we think about this? I don't think we have to do that. And I think it's a mistake to go to countries that we've considered enemies for a long time out of desperation to try to elicit some small amount of incremental oil production. I think that there are huge oil and gas reserves in the US and Canada, and that with not major, but some policy changes, which may be very hard for current elected officials to do given their constituents and their promises. But just functionally, we have the ability to deliver enough oil and gas over the next number of years to not feel that this is a national security issue. I think the panic is coming from the realization that the days of ultra cheap gasoline, which did not keep pace with general inflation, didn't even come close to keeping pace with general inflation, that those days are over. And I think that's going to hurt a number of political careers, as it should, um, because of, again, very unforced energy policy errors. You make a mistake, you have a consequence, it's your fault. Um, so, I mean, that's not like a, any particular political party, it's just a reality. If you mess up, and it's not Russia's fault and it's not Ukraine's fault, it's your fault if you mess up. And that's just true in general in life. So outside of that, we have the ability to deliver much more oil and natural gas and natural gas liquids here in the US and in Canada. And if we had a supportive policy environment instead of an antagonistic policy and regulatory environment, we could deliver sufficient hydrocarbons over time, not immediately, but there isn't an immediate emergency. It's not like we're actually running out right now. There's just higher prices that are going to be necessary. And it really is going to be necessary for a much more friendly uh, regulatory and fiscal environment. And we're not seeing it yet, but maybe we're headed that direction. Uh, Steve asked a question about investing. And I know that you've been on one company, particularly Canadian 
producer. And uh, I don't want to make the name unless you do, because I don't own any of it. Um, I should have, of course. But um, how does, how, when you, you talk about that particular company and you're picking out best producers and you talk about having inventory, I mean, oil in the ground, I imagine when you're talking about inventory, um, how, do you, how do you factor in that particular company relative to your criteria for what you just went through, for example, Canadian US markets availability, um, small, you, you know, you said on the small scale side, they have decades of inventory and, um, you know, they can probably run forever. How, how does, how do these small companies that like the one you mentioned, um, you can mention if you want, um, uh, fit your profile? So I'm actually missing, there's a Journey Band concert right now at the rodeo in Houston and I'm missing it. I would miss it anyway, because I have a three month old and I have to help take care of her, but I'm missing it right now. So it's actually quite painful. Um, they named the company band? after the band. Um, and so, so I, I do, I own Journey stock. This isn't a recommendation. Don't rely on anything I say about this. Do your own work. I think the things to look at for companies are one, management. So I feel very comfortable with Journey because management is anti-promotional. The CEO almost has an Eeyore complex. Everything is always a problem. And I think the very best managers in the world have that sort of uh, Morgan Housel, just who is the, my former intern member, he just wrote this amazing article about setting very low expectations in life. And if you set low expectations, they get exceeded. And so you have to be demanding of yourself, but also set low expectations of outcomes, and then you can get them exceeded. So he, this, this CEO is very good at that. He already does it. It's intrinsic to him. It's why he was so successful, I think, in his prior entities. So it starts with people. The Morgan Housel article, real quick, was also praising what sounds like your arch nemesis. <laughs> so, ironic, but uh, but a good point. And it kind of, and I'll, I'll let you go back here, but it, it kind of comes to the thing that Charlie Munger said about, about Musk was um, never underestimate someone who overestimates themselves. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't think that Musk is my arch nemesis. I just think that there's been this bubble era where people were rewarded for making representations about things. Um, and similar to the 90s, right? There were a number of people like this. And, and ironically, some of Musk's biggest backers, some of the people that owned giant portions of Tesla all the way through were some of the same people that owned similar companies in the 90s and blew up. And they've somehow like their track record from th that era disappeared and now they're billionaires and whatever. And it's amazing. Like people have no memory. You just go back. And good stuff is going to raise capital. If you're a good storyteller, you're going to raise capital. You can do it over and over again, even if you, you blow up. That, even if you it. obliterate it in basically the same thing or a similar thing over and over. So, you know, I think I think there's plenty of warning in terms of there having been things similar in history to Tesla. And, you know, Rivian's down 80%. Many of the other companies that are similar are down huge. The joke is that um, Nikola uh, imposed a, uh, a ban on car and truck sales to Russia. Um, <laughs> didn't have any. And that... <laughs> While we're talking, they've quietly produced another zero vehicles. Um, but with, with, I think they still have a multi-billion dollar market cap. So, you know, I mean, anything's possible. Um, Virtual signaling. <laughs> right. Well, I don't know that they actually did that. It's just, you know, unfortunately, you got to find humor, like you guys were saying, in a terrible situation. And I think that's uh, the Nikola. They've quietly produced zero vehicles or they've banned sales to someone. I feel like those are kind of the, the best kind of bubble jokes, especially on the tail end of the bubble. Um, so, so yeah, so, so journey, uh, so good management, the assets. So you can see in the reserve reports for companies and you can see in the original assessments of the assets, there's a certain amount of oil in the ground and there's a certain amount that's deemed recoverable. And you can see the, the engineering measures as part of why I liked oil and gas to start. I liked that there were these measured assessments. I mean, it's similar to real estate and other things where you kind of know what you're getting and you can know because you can physically measure it. It's not like a consumer brand where you have to guess what's going to be popular or uh, other sort of or technology where the technology changes for a commodity. You, you really can see what's there and then you can see the technology changes to extract more. And that's like a good starting point of what's there. Journey's sitting on almost a billion barrels of oil originally in place. They just updated their presentation. It's great. I had like estimated this stuff and they just like 
updated that. Um, of that, I think it's like 850, let's just say a billion, and it's a little lower than that. Of the, let's say, billion original barrels of oil in place, around 140 million have been produced. So they're sitting on 860 million barrels of oil that are, have not been produced, but have been measured by engineers such that they are this measurable amount of oil in the ground through various techniques. And it's not a sort of hand wavy, oh, I drilled one well in this place in Alaska or whatever, or Namibia, and now I have a zillion barrels of oil. No, it's, they, there are many wells in the field and there are, are, there's been a petroleum science for the last 150 plus years that's been developed around measuring it. So you have all this oil in the ground, a portion of that is booked as proved developed reserves. That's the portion that's already getting produced out that requires essentially no activity. That's roughly 25 to 30 million barrels. I have to check to see exactly kind of what needs, uh, what, what that number is, but let's just say roughly 25 million barrels. So they have a billion to start. They've produced historically, and they didn't own these fields for most of their history. They've produced 140 and they have 25 booked as needing no effort. Their estimate is based on their external reserve engineers who do this uh, externally and are responsible for very incorrect estimates on proved reserves. Their estimates are that they can go from essentially a 14% recovery to let's say a 28% recovery. So there's another 140 million barrels that they can get out with some degree of difficulty where they have booked the amount of expense they need to spend at, at you know, the start of the year dollars, so that's inflating, but uh, it's going to be more to get it all out. But you kind of know what they need to spend and you kind of know roughly what they're going to get. <coughs> so, sorry, what's that? I was just coughing, sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. So, um, so that's really helpful because that tells you that you can basically uh, 5x the amount of oil that they've tapped into with existing wells through additional activity that's booked. Then you have essentially the upside from improved technology, improved oil prices. Uh, once you do some, you end up delineating more. It's kind of like developing off into a field. At some point, you, if you develop a suburb out into a field, the next mile of field becomes the next mile that's adjacent to the suburb. So you can then go and develop more. Uh, so similar sort of concept from an oil field perspective, once you drill, then you can come back in and turn some wells into water injectors if that works or uh, figure out other sort of enhanced recovery techniques. And potentially you can get, let's say, 45% of the oil out of the ground eventually instead of 30%. And in some cases you can get 60 or 70, but realistically kind of getting the initial cut of 15 or 20% on primary, another 15 or 20% on water flood. And then if you're lucky, 15 to 20% from pumping CO2 in the ground, or surfactant or polymer, other stuff like that, um, that's kind of a rough guide. So the company has this giant amount of oil in fields that have already been developed that it's just sitting on. And so it's just a question of how many of those wells do they drill now? And how many they, do they drill later? And how many just never get drilled? And so it's less about um, them showing maps or hand waving or saying, ah, oh, my new technique is going to go explore in this area and drill. And it's just, they're just sitting on these giant oil pools. So the people and the engineering reports and the history, a lot of that gets me a lot of comfort. And then there's also the capital spend over time where they haven't spent almost any money on drilling, I think since the beginning of 2020. And their overall decline for their field was from about 10,000 barrels a day to around a little under 8,000 barrels a day. And then they bought a few hundred barrels a day of production recently, I guess last year, and they did a little bit of stuff just to stop the declines. So roughly over a two year period, their overall production declined by about 10% a year, which tells you there's a lot of oil in there and that they don't need to spend very much in order to keep their production level flat. Obviously they didn't, right? They let their production decline, but there was this real world two year test of what their decline rates were on their fields. And the answer was around 10%, so annually. So, so how, how, does, how does fracking, I mean, obviously everybody's here about fracking, fracking, fracking. Um, obviously it was highly desirable down in the, in the Texas basins that are uh, Permian, et cetera. Um, 
but how, how does that all factor into the production scale of things? I mean, is that a final high cost way of extracting? I mean, you just went through the litany of easy, easy to extract, a little bit more difficult to extract, hard to extract, unextractable. Um, and of course, I think, I think if I understand this, fracking is kind of like on the high cost side of you can't really get stuff out, but you, you know, you, you, you can get it out by, 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 you know, whacking, whacking it with science, whacking it with engineering. So how does so that all work? What I, what I was addressing was a conventional oil company and conventional oil fields. Mm -hmm. Conventional oil actually peaked, I think it was in the early 2000s, if not in the late 90s. So what Journey does and what select other companies do with conventional oil fields is really kind of on the tail end of the world kind of conventional oil activity that started in the 1850s. So we're kind of, we already went through Hubbard's Peak. We're already kind of on the tail of that. So it's great that Journey has it. And it's part of why I like them so much because they're sitting on all this oil that's really hard to find. And we're, we're not finding enough to replace what we're producing. Shale is its own whole thing. So shale is in many cases, the source rock for a lot of the conventional pools. And in some cases it was source rock, but the oil that escaped from it just went to the surface and you know, turned into tar or dissolved or whatever, or was eaten by bacteria. So um, generally it's been the source rock for big oil fields. So in the Permian Basin, there were lots of conventional fields that were fed by deeper shale. It's just a different, and, and usually shale isn't actually shale. It's like some combination of different um, actual rocks, but just very tight, hard to access, requiring fracking to access. So um, shale is a very extreme on the difficulty to extract. And it's a little complicated because some shale fields, you can do secondary recovery. So there's been fields where they've tested pumping natural gas down or CO2 down. And in some cases, that's worked in order to get more production and more reserves from it. In other cases, it hasn't worked. So, so it's kind of its own whole thing. But I think you're right in terms of thinking about if the EROI on a conventional oil field on initial development is 20. So every unit of energy you use to develop your conventional field, you get 20 units of energy back net of the gathering and the battery needed to hold the oil, you know, they call the tanks batteries, uh, and then uh, shipping it. Th let's say that's a 20 times energy return. Shale might be closer to a five times energy return. So it's much more energy intensive. And that varies a lot depending on what exactly you're going after, but just let's say roughly that. So it's doable. It's just intrinsically more expensive. And then a lot of the best shale wells and shale fields have already been developed, at least in the US and Canada. And so we're, we're on 50% or more of that already having been developed across the main fields. And the Wall Street Journal and others have written about that, various engineering and other firms have assessed that. And that seems to be roughly the consensus. There's still a decade left at current activity levels, approximately of shale good shale inventory. The problem is that that's at current activity levels, which is roughly keeping production flat it's not growing production like we probably need to in order to reduce the national security and other issues. Okay, basic B back here with another Q on O and G. Um, I mean, look, I'll be honest, Josh, there's so many things, I'm learning so much right now. And like, I I, I feel like sometimes half the stuff is going over my head just because- Your, your hair's standing up, up. You see that, right? Your hair's going straight up, yeah. And, and it's long right now too. Yeah, looks great. Uh, <laughs> thanks, man. You need a side shave. Too. Yeah, I know. But anyway, uh, Josh, what 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 headline out there that you've seen when it comes? Yeah, Steve, don't don't lie to me. I told you it was a basic beat question. Come on. I put it on, put it on mute just so you wouldn't have to hear it. But <laughs> I can't. You can't. No. Okay. Well. What, what's, I mean, what's some of the mainstream O&G headlines having to do with gas and oil price, all this stuff that it, just, I don't know if it grinds your gears or just something that you would want to address. I mean, and, and listen, that's one of the reasons I want to have Josh on. Stop laughing, Steve. This is one of the reasons. It's like you've been watching a lot of sitcoms with the family. Um. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I, I've I've had too much news on in the last uh, couple of days, but 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 in all seriousness, I mean, there's folks here who don't follow ONG as closely as you do. 
meaning well. um so i mean what what are some of the things that are out there that you think folks should not put as much weight into that you know just maybe do your own due diligence or here's some of the, the straight facts so one is and I, I i talked about this extensively that there are many claims being made by essentially by news agencies which seems a little inappropriate that about the deliverability or not of oil and the responsibility of various energy policies for more or less oil production in various places. And it just seems very weird and unfortunate and political. And I think that the right way to do it is just for news to report news, not to weigh in on whether or not X, Y, or Z thing. They should consult experts and then report on what the experts say, not, not make their own assessment and then just repeat that over and over and over again. And so I think that's been very disappointing and very odd because many of the reports about what's happening are tinged with this politics. And it might sound like what I was talking about was political, but I thought the prior administration made many mistakes from an energy policy perspective. And the one before that did as well. It's not about what political party they're in. It's about what specifically are they doing? And is that encouraging production and encouraging responsible activity that helps protect the world and the environment or are they encouraging activity that's not that and again so for me it's not about a party or or who wins what election it's about uh reasonable policy and then uh not trying to turn oneself into a pretzel in order to rationalize something that's just obviously wrong and so i think i think that's really been frustrating and it's part of why i talk so much about it um i think another thing that's really kind of been interesting are the reports around how much oil is actually coming out of russia right now or not and who's buying it and what happens and I think there's been a lot of misreporting around that too, because we're all rooting for the country that got invaded, right? I mean, it's just like we're in America, they're our ally, and we're not helping them because we don't want World War III. And many people are advocating for that anyway, which is scary to me because I don't want World War III. And I think a utilitarian approach is to just say, hey, you know, one country getting devastated is maybe better than the whole world dying in a nuclear holocaust. And so um, I think that's a, that's a thing to be aware of. But I think we want to be careful to not let our sentiment and emotions affect our assessment of the economic situation. And the economic situation is that Russia is way better off right now, maybe than they've ever been. The price of almost all of their exports is super high, even after the deduct for you know, the discount for Russian oil and Russian whatever, they're getting to sell their commodities for prices they haven't seen in some cases ever. And so, and their country is so heavily oriented towards commodity production and export that this is a huge surplus for them. In addition to this, they are now unburdened by trade rules that required them to allow US tech monopolies and other sort of kind of anti-competitive stuff in their country. So they can have their own Facebook, they can have their own Twitter, they can have their own YouTube. They couldn't do this before because it would have violated various trade rules. And we let China do it, I don't know why, but this has been a massive boon for Russia economically. And no one is talking about that. And yeah, it's bad for certain oligarchs and bad for certain whatever, but the amount of cash piling up net to Russia from what they're doing is huge. And that doesn't mean, again, like I'm pro-Ukraine, right? It's terrible for countries to invade each other. Um, and we're in 2022 and that just shouldn't happen. And there should be consequences. But pretending like we're causing consequences when we're really just handing over giant amounts of cash I think is unfortunate and it's kind of self-defeating, right? Similar to the energy policy. Like if we want the world to be a, a cleaner, better place, let's go fund a lot of energy research to be able to find the next thing. Let's not go build stuff that's very polluting and has a low EROI. Similar idea, if we want to hurt Russia, let's figure out how to hurt Russia without causing World War III, not pretend like we're hurting them when we're actually substantially enriching them and bolstering them. And again, like it, it doesn't take a lot of math. You look at how much they exported these things. You look at the percent of their GDP or GNP, um, which is probably a better way to measure this at much lower prices. And then you see what the impact is. And I mean, it's just, it doesn't take, <laughs> it only takes a few math problems to solve to be able to see that. Shit. Yeah, sorry. 
No, that's, I mean, no, I mean, look, it's, it's, wow, that's interesting. I mean, like, I, that's, I'd never, yeah, I don't even know how to respond to that, that last part, right? Like, that's just so confounding, right? I, did you, I mean, Steve, Kevin, did you guys know that at all? Like, I, I think, I you, think it's, um, it's easy to be skeptical, you know, of that, um, for a few different reasons. And we could probably talk about that for hours at a time. That's a little bit of a distraction from, from the purpose of this podcast. Sure. Um, you know, for, for me, the immediate thing that comes to mind without knowing the specifics uh, as well as Josh does here is, um, you know, we remember <laughs> the uh, post-World War II um, Soviet Union uh, technological expertise. And I think we've seen in the case uh, of the war specifically, that uh, there's still uh, a, a bit of lacking there. And that, that's because of the top-down economy, right? So, you know, Josh makes the mention, well, now, great, they can have their own Facebook or they can have their own <laughs> YouTube or, you know, whatever. Well, you know, I mean, Donald Trump is creating a social media <laughs> platform as well right now that isn't going very well. And I would, I would venture to guess in specifics like that um, where, where there's technological uh, uh, not not expertise there. Now, on the other hand, um, you know there is decades of uh, expertise in you know again oil and gas and things like that, uh, more hard products and and uh, and much more experience there. But you know when you have a top down economy, you're always going to have a significant significantly more grift um, and you know long term. Long term, uh, I, I can't see that it's a positive economically for Russia to be cut off from the world economy. And but you know, assuming they are cut off, which they actually really are not. There's one other thing you said there, which matters a lot too. I think, which is the the grift comment. I totally agree. And again, none of this is a rationalization or a. I just you know, the question was, hey, what's getting misreported? And like U.S. sanctioning Russia oil doesn't. I mean, it will matter actually for Russian oil production because I think different from what you were saying, they actually don't have the in-country expertise to properly develop their oil fields. And so there's a high probability that Russian oil production will fall materially over the next few years if sanctions stay on, especially technology sanctions. And um, you know, if, weather, if Weatherford and Halbert and Schlumberger can't go do services there, I think Russia's in- they can pay, I mean, are, isn't there Chinese expertise that would be there is supported for the right price or no? Um, the Chinese companies use those same service so providers. Western, so we have Western companies uh, essentially that have a monopoly or an oligopoly on that expertise. Um, you know, that's an interesting comment, yeah. Yeah, but, but, uh, but in terms of the grift specifically, one of the things you find with this sort of setup is if the people that were grifting can no longer transfer funds out of country, then they still have, you know, when you're wealthy, you want various things, you end up maybe consuming more of those things domestically, and you could end up actually with um, less. And again, it's still terrible, but just observing reality, the reality is if you're a bil Russian billionaire, you now can't go hang out in your house. You may not be your house anymore in London. You have to hang out in your house in Moscow or on the Black Sea or wherever. And that ends up with lot, lots more domestic consumption. And yeah, maybe I'm wrong on the, they build their own Facebook, but one, they can just steal the software. And again, I'm not condoning this, but the reality is you can just clone a lot of this stuff. And a lot of Chinese companies seem to have essentially done that. But more importantly, on the real economy side, you end up with just much more money circulating within the country with much more hard currency in the country because of the extra high prices for the exports from the country. So you could end up really with like a much stronger domestic economy just from funds coming in and there being fewer places externally for those funds to go. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was funny. They, there's comments about nationalizing the McDonald's. <laughs> you know, it goes my friend, uh, my friend Russian Bear, uh, who waited in those lines in the 1980s when the first McDonald's was open, the Soviet Union. And, you know, today there are lines again because of the threat that they would be closed. Well, if they're closed and they are then nationalized, um, 
uh, you know, would you trust the quality, I guess, going forward? <laughs> well, that's like the joke. That's like the joke around um, that Russians are about to be the healthiest, uh, most sane people in the world, right? You cut them off Facebook, cut them off McDonald's, cut them off Coca-Cola, uh, you know, maybe cut them off certain Western medicines that are, you know, maybe some opiates or whatever. I mean, man, they're going to be uh, the correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't think it's really true, right? Obviously, like people find various things to poison themselves with and to waste their time. But there is a little bit of, you know, I, obviously, it's funny, because it's a little true and, um, and a little tough. And, you know, obviously, we're, th there's a situation where, you know, I say all these things about oil and gas and the economy, and it's really tragic. And I think we all understand that and appreciate that it's really like, this is a terrible thing that shouldn't have happened. Um, and that we would hope that we could find a way to prevent happening again and to end as soon as possible. And I think part of the my motivation in sharing my observations on the effectiveness or not of sanctions as well as energy policy is out of a hope that, and you know, I have very low expectations of this, but hey, maybe maybe someone hears someone saying something rational about sanctions or energy policy and figures out some way to do it better and we end up doing it. So and I mean, I think the prevailing issue, not only with Russia and Ukraine, but in this whole discussion today, is this lack of intellectual honesty. And obviously, you know, our, our um, uh, hatred for that, you know, it's very difficult to make rational decisions when uh, significant players in that via government or other, other major actors are so intellectually dishonest. Um, and, you know, but that's what makes a market essentially because there, there are mispricings in the market for specific companies or specific industries because of that, you're arbitraging, you know, kind of honesty in some cases, you're, on, you're arbitraging a reality, some sort of perception. Um, and, you know, it's our job, I think, as investors to find that, find that arbitrage um, and, and invest in it and profit from it to, to reduce it. And over time, that would lead to more intellectual honesty. Yeah, I completely, I completely agree, and and that's actually something. So one thing that I'm doing that Bison's doing is we're investing in additional oil production in the U.S. and Canada. And so you, know, you can't do a lot, but you can do what you can do. And we've participated in several different financings very recently that closed in the last week to help fund additional development of mostly conventional resource so far mostly in Canada, where there are dollars are going to spend on additional wells that may not have been drilled otherwise to add additional production to help. And again, like I can't solve that problem, but there is a way to solve the problem and it's very economic to solve that problem as well. There's the price signal. So we're responding to the price signal. It's not like I'm sacrificing, but I am doing something proactively to address it. And again, if we just do what we can, to proactively address things and don't buy into various narratives, just try to figure out what truth is and then where economics are. I think those, those things often correlate. And I, I think Stephen, I think you made a really good point around that. All right, guys, I think, I think that's a great place to end it right there um, on a hopeful note. Um, and so with that, uh, where can our audience go and find more information for each of you? Kevin, I'll start with you. Oh, I'm still at the good prick. <laughs> <laughs> on on Twitter and oh by the way by the way Steve I'm almost I'm almost up to a thousand uh, people now. It's, my, it's our it's our fault. It's because we haven't been doing this every week. That's really that's really the issue. We'll get them over a thousand now. Now that we got Josh, now that Josh is on here and he's going to be tagged, don't worry. Kevin, Kevin's about to get a huge boom. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and then Steve, where can people go and follow you? I uh, yeah, what is my what is my Twitter actually? It's been a it's been a little while. Um, yeah, it's Stephen underscore Keel K I E L, um, and uh, you can check out Arquitos Capital at arquitos.com, A R Q U I T O S. And Josh, where can people go and follow you? Uh, Bisoninterests.com or Josh underscore Young underscore One on Twitter and uh or bison interest twitter and i guess i didn't get a chance I, I should just explain for a second twitter why i post all the time so there's a certain amount of this sort of dialogue which is great and then they're seeing headlines that are either mind-blowing because they are potentially hugely market moving or seeing policies announced or kind of duplic duplicitous whatever and 
I found it very cathartic to share it. And, um, and so, you know, if you speak to the wall, the wall doesn't speak back to you. If you share it on social media, you get various responses. And then it also, it's been very educational to do that because sometimes I'm totally wrong in my interpretation of stuff. And I found out, <laughs> you find out very fast and people are very unforgiving. And so, you know, it's really helpful to get fact checked and very helpful in terms of sanity checking as well. Awesome. Well, I think I can speak for Stephen and, and Kevin when I say, uh, you know, thanks for fielding all of our questions today. Like that, that was really, really helpful, including my basic B questions. And um, yeah, listen, all, all you guys, thank you for being on here. Always a pleasure. And uh, let's do it again sometime, huh? Appreciate it, guys. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate it.